Next, ladies and gentlemen, um, Paul Nurse. Uh, Paul is, Sir Paul is president and head of the Rockefeller Institute in New York uh, and head of the Laboratory of Yeast Genetics and Cell Biology. His distinctions range from a PhD in cell biology from the University of East Anglia to the Légion d'Honneur, the Copley Medal of the Royal Society, an honorary freemanship of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, and, of course, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2001, <laughs> awarded for his work on the cell cycle. He was once described by the Sun newspaper as the David Beckham of science. <laughs> The truth is, the Sun newspaper have never seen me kick a football. <laughs> um, I want to turn to, um, for this eight minutes, to how the ideas, or two ideas of Darwin, continue to influence biomedicine, of how the human organism works in health and disease, and also the ways in which we investigate human health and disease. Um, the two ideas that I'm going to talk about, um, with three examples, are the concept of natural selection and the second idea of the tree of life. And I'm going to begin with natural selection. Because when we combine Darwin's concept of natural selection as a major driver in evolutionary change with 20th century understanding of genetics, what we know, of course, as the modern synthesis, we get a very profound insight into two important phenomena for human health. One is adaptive immunity, the second is cancer. Now, to explain this, um, I first want to uh, describe um, the phenomenon of natural selection in more abstract terms, um, drawing heavily on the arguments of Muller um, in the, uh, a mid-20th mid century geneticist. And he argued that for a living thing, for a living entity to undergo natural selection, it must have three properties. Those three properties are the entity must reproduce, it must have a, a hereditary system, that is some sort of genetics, um, whereby the information of that genetic system defines the characteristics of the entity, how it grows, how it reproduces, um, many aspects of its, uh, of the, its behavior. And that particular uh, uh, um, characteristics, those genetics, are inherited during the process of reproduction. And thirdly, um, that heredity system exhibits variability upon which natural selection works. Now, these properties are, of course, organ uh, properties of organisms, but they're also properties of cells. Cells have an hereditary system. They have genomes that determine the cellular behavior, particularly their reproduction, and it exhibits variability. And we are, of course, made up of cells. And the fact that cells can be subject to natural selection is important for immunity, it is important for cancer. Let's start with immunity. Um, clonal selection, a beautiful idea from McFarlane Burnett, explains adaptive immunity in the following way. Lymphocytes, a component of the immune system, have surface receptors. They bind to antigens. Um, antigens that are produced by um, infectious organisms such as bacteria. And the binding of those antigens promote those lymphocytes to divide. The lymphocytes themselves can act in the immune system either by producing antibodies or by engulfing um, those, that infectious organism. This is a beautiful system. What you have is a hypervariable uh, system generating um, highly genetically variable uh, 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 receptors which then uh, can be selected by the presence of a particular antigen to go on and divide. So it's a great example of, um, of natural um, selection. Um, the lymphocytes themselves, when they're promoted to reproduce, of course generate then a response to that infectious agent providing a defense system. The second example I want to talk about is cancer. Um, there are maybe two, three, four hundred genes um, in the human genome that are important for uh, reproduction of uh, cells. And um, as we age, a genetic damage accumulates in some of these genes, eventually causing sufficient damage to promote those particular cells, which are precancerous, becoming cancerous, to divide out of control. And when sufficient damage has been accumulated, 
then these cells will generate within their tissue and organ of origin a tumour, um, which is a mass of uncontrolled dividing cells. So we can consider cancer as a somatic genetic disease occurring in the soma, in the body. The cells undergo genetic changes, and that induces uh, the uh, ability to divide out of control, which is inherited by every cancerous cell that is then generated. Once again, this is natural selection. Increased reproduction is selected for because genes causing it are handed on more efficiently to those progeny, which are, uh, a cellular progeny, which are damaged um, in comparison with other cells in the uh, tissue. So this is just like selection in a, 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 a population of organisms, but it's occurring in a population of cells within our body. The third example I want to tell you about um, concerns a second concept of Darwin. That is the tree of life. Um, the tree of life Darwin first drew in his, uh, his uh, notebook of 1837. It's also in a modified form in the 1859 version of The Origin of Species. And the tree of life implies that all living organisms, including humans, are related by descent. Therefore, and this is the important point to be made here, the study of simpler model organisms can help greatly to understand how we ourselves work both in health and disease. Several examples of this. There is innate immunity. And innate immunity, uh, the molecular basis of it, was discovered in the fly, the fruit fly so-called toll receptors, which are important for that. Several years later, it was found exactly the same type of molecules were important in human innate immunity. But finding it in flies opened up that field. The homeobox genes also discovered in flies are crucial for vertebrate and human development, particularly body segmentation. But the, uh, the uh, uh, example, which is my favorite, because I worked on it uh, myself, was the control of cell reproduction, which I worked on in yeast, which is barely an, an organism that you would think was an organism. It's so lowly in um, the living kingdom. But discovering um, the gene in yeast that controls cell division and discovering mutants in uh, that gene, which mean that those yeast cells couldn't divide, gave a way of finding the same gene in humans simply by taking a human library sprinkling the genes of the human library onto the yeast cells, and if there was an equivalent in humans of that yeast gene, then if a yeast cell took up that human gene, it could then grow and divide. I want to just emphasize the, the extraordinary um, uh, fact, what this means. It means yeast and humans having diverged over one, perhaps 1.5 billion years ago, one could take uh, the gene from humans put it into yeast, even in, uh, in working in such a complicated phenomena as cell division, and it would work perfectly. This is an extraordinary example of the unity of life. And it is the use of these model organisms in um, biomedicine that helps greatly now work on the worm, on the fly, work even on bananas, um, work on yeast, on the mouse, helps us understand humans and how humans uh, work. John Sulston, who you'll be hearing about later, um, who pioneered um, the sequencing of worm and then of humans, has shown that a very high percentage of genes are common between these different organisms, well over 50%. I want to finish with one final point. Given that all the biosphere is related, as Darwin argued with the tree of life, then the rest of the living world are our cousins, so to speak. And I think one of the better arguments for us taking care of the rest of the biosphere is, uh, and acting as good stewards is that really we're only looking after our own family. So I really endorse that. Thank you very much. <laughs>